Welcome to your weekly constitutional radio show about the Constitution, produced in partnership with the home of the Constitution, James Madison's Montpelier. My name is Stuart Harris, and I teach constitutional law at the Appalachian School of Law in beautiful Grundy, Virginia. And I'm speaking to you today from the studios of WETS-FM and WETS-HD1 in Johnson City, Tennessee. Say, who is Edward Snowden? You know, you know who I'm talking about, that young fellow who just showed up on our television screens one day and apparently had spilled the beans on all sorts of deep, dark secrets of the National Security Agency, uh, which was apparently spying on us and looking at a lot of our phone records and doing all sorts of other things that have got lots and lots of people rather upset with us these days. Now, of course, originally Ed Snowden portrayed himself as a whistleblower, as a fighter for freedom, as someone who didn't want to cause us any harm, but who simply wanted to help us and let us know what our government was up to. And there are people who still think of him that way. Then he went to China. And then he went to Russia. And now people are beginning to wonder whether all those secrets he has in his, I think, four laptops, uh, whether, whether he's just another garden variety defector or some people have even said he's a traitor or a criminal. Well, I think we're going to have to leave that question of exactly what he is and who he is to another day or maybe even to posterity. I bet we'll be arguing over this one for decades. But in the meantime, a lot of people have been thinking of this whole situation as something new, as something that's never happened before. And in a purely technological sense, that's probably true. I mean, some of the techniques that Snowden has described and some of the technology that's being used is no doubt cutting edge, brand new stuff most of us have never even heard of. But the broader issue, the, the issue of simply intercepting communications, even, even the relatively modern concept of electronic communications, that's actually an old issue. It's an issue that's been around for a long, long time. And fortunately, I know a guy who knows all about it and who's going to come on today and he's going to tell us all about the history of the interception of such communications. His name is Joseph Fitzanakis. He's on the faculty at a nearby institution, a marvelous institution called King University in Bristol, Tennessee. And recently, I spoke to him. I am a member of faculty at uh, King University in Bristol, Tennessee, at the Department of History and Political Science. And my specialization and the classes that I teach there are for the Security and Intelligence Studies program. I'm also director of King's Institute for Security and Intelligence Studies. Wow. Now, have you actually been a, a spook, a spy? Have you actually gone out and done the cloak and dagger stuff yourself? I could tell you that, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> well, we're very happy to have you here today. And we, uh, of course, you and I first uh, met when we both were interviewed on a local TV station uh, about this Verizon phone record scandal, the Edward Snowden affair. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? What's going on with that now? Which is still with us, by the way, and making headlines almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Edward Snowden, a former technical uh, expert at the Central Intelligence Agency and also a contractor at the National Security Agency, appears to have become disillusioned at some point about the premises of his whole career and uh, left for China, uh, for Hong Kong, and he revealed a whole bunch of stuff, which he apparently has a whole file of, a whole folder of files with him. Mm. He keeps re revealing some of them every day. And among the things he revealed is that the National Security Agency is engaged in a mass surveillance program of electronic communications, both email, phone, social networking sites, etc. And their whole idea seems to be to capture, it looks like, everything, put it in a big pot somewhere, and then periodically dip down into it and do what they call data mining, right? Absolutely. They, the NSA, the National Security Agency, is the largest American intelligence agency. It's bigger than the FBI and the CIA combined, mm. and it's the wealthiest as well. Even though it's a big agency, they don't have the personnel they require to spy on every single individual they're targeting. And so what they do instead, they, they opted for this model of surveillance, which they basically store everything. They type everything, store everything, and keep it in case they ever need it. Um, that's the mass surveillance system that they are, seem to be following nowadays. Wow, some obvious civil liberties and constitutional implications of that. But before we get to those, 
I, I understand that you can put this in some sort of historical context for us. You can help us understand whether this is unique or whether this has been going on in U.S. history. In fact, I understand that's your, your area of specialization, isn't it? It is. My actual area of specialization is on the politics of wiretapping in American history and British history as well. And so, you know, people like me had a, quite a bit of a different reaction when Snowden said all the things he did. Most people, I think, were kind of sort of like, oh, good, my goodness, what's going on here? For us, it was more like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Uh, because this well, yeah good we'll take us back to the beginning what uh, the, when, when did all this sort of stuff start happening in this country well first of all the the official term for wiretapping is interception of communications is what we call it in the field and I have to say that interception of communications in America goes back to the beginning of even when America was still a colony under the king's mandate the king had the right to intercept all male circulating in the British Empire. It continued to the emergence of telegraphy, which incidentally, in, in places like Britain, it was uh, under the government. The, the government saw it as too important to be left to the private sector. So they actually ran the telegraph? Absolutely, and oh. the telephone. In 1912, the British government actually nationalized the telephone system because it saw it as too critical to be left to the private sector, too sensitive. And it was a conservative government too. Mm -hmm. practically a Bolshevik style takeover of the telephone industry in Britain. In America it was a bit different. Uh, America left it to the private sector uh, following a different model, but the government saw it as imperative to have very close connections with the telephone industry because the government wanted to have access to the content of communication. The telephone began to emerge in America around the turn of the century and it just so happened that the prominence of the telephone, the, the, the spread of the medium across the United States, coincided with the emergence of the Prohibition era. And so a lot of uh, organized crime made tremendous use of the telephone from, from 1913 to 1925 or so. And that gave the impetus, a justification for the government to say, look, you know, this, this system we call the telephone is basically penetrating every facet of daily life and as we police daily life with law enforcement we also have to police this new network of communication and that's some of the some of the first examples of uh, interception of communications wiretapping we see in america is against bootleggers and organized crime associated with the prohibition also against prostitution mm -hmm. uh, prostitution networks made a tremendous use of telephone hence the term call girls that's when right. it actually emerged. That was kind of like the criminal side of things. They began right, and that's criminal. actually the first time I encountered this as a law student. Um, we read the Olmstead case in law school, and that was a 1928 case where the United States Supreme Court actually said that the, the, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments uh, were not implicated when the government wiretapped. I believe they compared listening into a telephone call to just eavesdropping. And, you know, if a, if a police officer could stand outside your window and listen to your argument with your wife, he could tap into your telephone. And that decision actually wasn't even reversed on for, for years and years. I think it was 1967 in the Katz case. So uh, the, the Supreme Court was on board originally with a sort of interception. Everybody seemed to think it was okay just to tap into communications. Actually, for many decades, the interception regime in the United States was ruled by the Federal Communications Act of 1935. Section 605 prohibited unlawful interception and divulgence of communications. But the government, law enforcement agencies, took that to mean that it's okay to intercept so long as you don't divulge. <laughs> Which you can see, you oh, know... that sounds like a lawyerly reading. Okay, it's okay, we, we can intercept, we just don't tell anybody. That we did it. I and see. for All many right. decades, that's how it was seen. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until Watergate that this really became sort of, uh, kind of was supposed to change, really, in, in the practical sense, to be right. honest. Um, it wasn't until 67, until, of course, warrants were required in this area. So lots of people who might be listening to this can very vividly remember life in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. And there's a good chance uh, that some of them might have been on the telephone and somebody might have been listening in prior to 1967. And they really would have had no recourse at that time. Especially in small towns, because, you know, in bigger cities, it was a little more difficult to get a wiretap, you know, installed. But 
in a small town, small city, if the police wanted to wiretap somebody, what they would do is just forget about the warrants and things. Just go down to the local telephone, you know, headquarters and say, look, you know, can we just get a tap on this guy? A lot of this was done through informal, non-institutional arrangements. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised, even in big cities sometimes, how often large law enforcement agencies relied on informal connections with the telephone companies to get some of these wiretaps installed. Um, we have a case, for example, in the New York in the 1950s, Samuel Dash um, did a great study of this, where he revealed, he actually found out that the New York Police Department had officially about 5,000 wiretaps installed between 1950 and 1955. The actual number was close to 175,000. Good grief. Uh, big difference. Good grief. And I guess the technology was such, especially early on, that it was just a matter of finding the choke points, right? Finding the junctions where these calls were coming in. And once you found that, you could pretty much listen in on anybody you wanted, right? Sure. And that's one thing that's changed in the last, say, 15 years or so, that it used to be quite expensive to install a wiretap. You had to have a pretty good financial reason to justify, because you had to send some people out, a whole like crew, find the junction, get the assistance of the telephone company, and so on and so forth. Sometimes you had to go very close to the actual target to install a wiretap. But since the fiber optic revolution, it's become a lot more feasible to spy from a distance uh, on people's communications and a lot more feasible to spy en masse, to spy a large, you know, kind of uh, indiscriminately. All you have to do is run a separate line from the phone company's offices to the local police department or FBI offices, etc. It's really that simple. Hmm. Well, if I understand, uh, there have been several eras that you've identified in the history of this sort of thing. We've talked about the first one, right, the 1920s and all of that. What were some of the other eras and what were the, the attitudes that were uh, toward electronic uh, interception during those times? Well, before we uh, leave behind the 1920s, let's just remember that World War I happened mm -hmm. uh, right before then and that was one of the kind of the first telephone war you can call it because both sides for the first time made massive use of phone communications and that kind of convinced the american government that this this was also a political means for control and so a lot of people were trained to wiretap enemy communications in world war one came back to america and this was then, for the first time, this model of interception for political reasons, not criminal reasons, hmm. was, was basically practiced inside the United States. This is a time of the, the first Red Scare uh, with the Palmer raids and so on and so forth, where basically America was in fear of anarchists, communists, people that had done the revolution in the Soviet Union. There was this fear that it might actually, it might actually happen here as well. And a very young FBI special agent called J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> was in charge of the FBI's first political policing unit, the so-called General Intelligence Division, the GID. And for the first time, Hoover and his people used wiretaps to monitor people for political reasons, not for criminal reasons. And that's where it gets a bit controversial, obviously, because criminal policing is very different to political policing. Mm -hmm. I guess the justification was, and I'm certainly not taking J. Edgar Hoover's part, the justification was that people thought that the communists were not just another garden variety political party, but that they were subversives who were intent upon violently overthrowing the government. So I guess that would have, they would have said, what well, we're really looking for are criminal conspiracies to overthrow the government. We're not just policing politics. That's very true, and if you talk to certain sectors of the community back in the 20s, and even during McCarthyism in the 50s, they were convinced that America was basically right before a revolution. This was a time when radical politics were very prominent, not just in America, but also in Europe. On the other hand, you would argue that uh, Edgar Hoover and his people took this to completely new levels. Hoover did not just spy on political radicals, he spied on uh, workers' unions, he spied on homosexuals, he spied on politicians mm -hmm. for his own private reasons. He even uh, wired up uh, the, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We know for a fact because this has, has been declassified, he spied on King's house. He wiretapped all of his business offices and partners and friends. He wiretapped every motel room that King ever stayed in. He even wired up his church pu pulpit so you can hear what he was saying on a Sunday, uh, every Sunday. 
So uh, Hoover, although he had in his mind a justification, a political justification for this type of wiretapping, eventually he completely went out of control with it. And that's not my personal view, that's the view of committees that were formed to investigate the Watergate Right, before we get down to the church committee and all of that stuff, it, it does seem to be that J. Edgar Hoover sort of embodies, he is the personification of what can happen when you don't have adequate controls over government interception of communications. I mean, he he's the guy who shows you what will happen if you don't monitor these people, if you don't keep them under control. Hoover was a state within a state. Mm -hmm. The FBI was his own empire. Right. And in fact, they had a lot of turf wars, not just with the government of the United States as a whole, but also with other intelligence agencies, including the CIA, for many, many years. Hoover was the head of the FBI for over four decades, remember, mm -hmm. until his death in the 70s. For many decades, he didn't speak to the CIA director. They do it in not speaking terms. So he had a lot of uh, turf wars with other uh, members of the government. Another thing about Hoover is, Officially, he was against wiretapping. He would actually go to Congress and give speeches about the the uh, the fact that his FBI does not rely on wiretapping because he thought it was unethical. He, what he would do was actually quite fascinating. He would command all of his special agents to turn off all wiretaps around the nation for just a few hours. He would go to the Congress and say, I can assure you that as of right now, there are no FBI wiretaps in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go back to his office and have him turned on. Oh man, yeah. man, that that is that is quite a trick. <laughs> Absolutely. Another thing, of course, about this is uh, during Hoover's time, we don't just have the civil rights struggle in the United States. We also have the anti-war movement, which rose in response to the war in Vietnam. Uh, Hoover believed was convinced that both the SCLC, the Martin Luther King's people, and the anti-war movement were moved by centers outside the United States, anti-American centers. So he was convinced that the Soviet Union was behind both of those things. And that gave him the justification to also spy on anti-war activists, who, regardless of what one might think about anti-war activism, the fact is that these activists were completely legal based on the constitutional framework that we have in this country. And so we have e examples of people who were basically had their phones tapped for over a decade when they had a blank criminal record and never ever resulted in any kind of, um, any kind of convictions or even anybody being taken to court. Uh, so that, you know, that's the reason why a lot of people consider, uh, those of us who study the history of wiretapping, Consider the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a period when American wiretapping regimes were completely out of control. It's Weekly Constitutional. I'm Stuart Harris, and I'm speaking with Joseph Fitzanakis of King University, all about the interception of electronic communications. Uh, despite what you might think, all this stuff that Ed Snowden's been talking about at the NSA, it's been happening quite a long time. After the break, we'll have our constitutional quiz, and then we'll come back and speak some more with Joseph Fitzanakis. Stay tuned. You're listening to your weekly constitutional. I'm Stuart Harris, and I'm speaking with Joseph Fitzanakis of King University, all about the fascinating history of the interception of electronic communications. Before the break, we were talking about J. Edgar Hoover and some of the abuses that occurred under his stewardship of the FBI. Many of those abuses were revealed in something called the Church Committee investigation. Well, President Nixon entered the White House uh, promising to put an end to this kind of rampant use of telephone surveillance. And we have examples of his speeches in Congress where he's talking about how he's going to put an end to this. Well, the next thing you know, of course, we have Watergate, which is basically Nixon using the same tricks and methods that Hoover was using, but this time not against anti-war activists or radicals of any kind, but against his political rivals in the mainstream of American politics, namely the Democratic Party. And when this happened, Congress eventually had to step in and say, look, we cannot trust the executive anymore to oversee the interception regime in this country. Okay, this, we've proven that you cannot do it right. Nixon is a great example. And so the Congress stepped in with two committees, the Pike Committee in the House, and church committee? the church yeah, committee, church committee in, in, the Senate, in, yeah. in the Senate. And these we did not just stop at what happened in Watergate. They demanded the clean house. They wanted to go into the CIA and the FBI and the NSA and other agencies like that and say, 
what have you been doing all this time while Congress has not been looking? And that's when we realized that really these agencies were completely unmonitored. This is when all that stuff came out, the so-called crown jewels at the CIA, right? You know, the fact that we were trying to overthrow regimes in, in Guatemala, right? Guatemala and in where else? The Congo. Iran, the Iran. Congo, Cuba. Cuba, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all sorts of stuff that was coming out during that time, yeah. And I guess also the wiretap regime. The press loved it. It was a field, Dave. I mean, they right. had a great time because every day there was like new headlines. But the reason that we're talking about this to, is to point to the fact that what Snowden's talking about is not really new in American history. It actually seems to go in cycles. There's a time when Congress is not looking. They're distracted. They look elsewhere. After the Church and the Pike Committee hearings, there were some reforms, weren't there? Massive reforms. Massive reforms. Let's talk about some of those legal reforms. What what was the reaction after all this this dirt came out? Well, it wasn't just the reforms themselves. It wasn't just a legal framework that changed. Basically, Congress said we're going to have these committees, the Pike and Church committees, are going to become permanent essentially, and we're going to we demand to know everything you're doing, the intelligence services are doing. You cannot do uh, massive surveillance or any kind of extensive intelligence operation unless you notify not just the president of the United States but also Congress. And these are the Intelligence Oversight Committees in right. each House of Congress, right? Now, of course, that wasn't exactly perfect because in many cases, for example, Ronald Reagan um, kind of sidelined those uh, during Nicaragua when mm -hmm. he was instructed by Congress not to send the Contras any money in the 80s, and he did it through Israel. Uh, also, the Iran-Contra scandal as well. Right. Uh, so, so it's not be circumvented. Did he instruct people over at the? Uh, well, of course, we deny that he did it. But there were some of his minions, notably Oliver North, who dissembled before those committees. Yes, and and there were really, you know, it was kind of an embarrassing moment for the Reagan administration. Reagan himself, like you said, said he had no idea about this. Some believe it, some don't. But that's to show that this this uh, new framework of uh, oversight is not. Perfect. Right. I guess people can lie. Oliver North, in fact, was convicted of lying to Congress, wasn't he? Absolutely. Yes, he was convicted, criminally convicted. And I recall vividly his very buxom young assistant. I believe her name was Fawn Hall. And of course, because she was so young and pretty, she got lots and lots of press coverage. But she did say one notable thing. She was actually being grilled before these committees. And they were asking her about whether or not she thought it was important to obey the law and the Constitution. And she said, well, sometimes you have to obey a higher law. And that just encapsulated the attitude that people like Oliver North and others in the administration had, which is that they were serving a higher law, or as Nixon once infamously said, if the president says it's okay, that makes it constitutional. And that is almost always the attitude that even a well-intentioned executive department will sort of go to as a default if people aren't questioning it. But, but going back to the 70s, before we leave the 70s, wasn't there a major statute, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, that was enacted immediately after the Church and Pike hearings? And could you talk about that a little bit? FISA. FISA. FISA, right. FISA is basically the reason why FISA was designed. Uh, and that's not exactly spoken, uh, but it's kind of a tacit thing that... The intelligence community came and said, okay, fine, you don't want us to intercept on a mass scale, but what happens to foreign spies, people who actually do have a connection with a foreign intelligence service? How do we spy on them? And the compromise that was arrived at is like it has to be a secret court that if you want to spy somebody who lives in America, a U.S. person, somebody who lives here without necessarily having citizenship, in order to spy on them, you have to go, and if you suspect they have an intelligence connection, you have to go to this FISA court, which is a secret court, Okay, and they will give you the permission to do it because they want everything to be legal. The criticism of the FISA court is that it's seen often as a rubber stamp process where the submissions that are given to the FISA court by the intelligence community almost invariably are approved. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's been only like two or three cases where it hasn't been approved of like thousands and thousands of cases. Right. What's interesting to me, Joseph, before we even get into the criticisms of the court, is the title of the act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And that points out a very important dichotomy. Um, even at the lowest point, even when we were uh, you know, in the church committee hearings, I think there was an abhorrence of spying on U.S. citizens maybe others in the U.S., 
But at the same time, there was much less concern or maybe even support for spying on foreigners. And so as long as the CIA or the NSA could say, oh, we're just spying on these people overseas, people in this country really weren't that concerned about it. But as soon as it was directed at us, that's when the civil liberties things came in. And so the very structure of the act was it only really kicks in when spying starts crossing our own borders and coming back home. And that's when the government has to go in front of the special court. And they take these federal judges who are specially selected by the Chief Justice of the United States and they put them in this room. And whenever these intelligence agencies want to spy on somebody within the geographical boundaries of the United States, um, they have to go in and ask for these special warrants. And that provides some level of comfort because all of a sudden you've got these members of the third branch of the government, the judiciary, coming in and supposedly giving impartial judgments based on the Constitution, based on the statutory authorities. But there's no way for the rest of us to really know what's going on there. So it still boils down to trust us. Not just trust the executive anymore, not just trust the Congress to be oversight, now trust the judiciary, but still trust us. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, it's interesting how if you look at the history of American intelligence institutions, how skeptical Americans have always been of, of intelligence institutions, mm -hmm. even when the CIA was formed uh, right after the war. Many American politicians were very skeptical about authorizing it. The, uh, some of them even said this is like a, an American Gestapo of some sort. They, That's always the, the concern. Right. Uh, the, the feeling is that we don't do this in America. This is what the crazy Europeans are doing over there. You know, we don't do this kind of stuff in America. And so the compromise that was reached is that, fine, we can have a CIA and an NSA so long as the only uh, direct their arsenal, which is formidable, uh, outside the borders of the United States. Mm -hmm. We can't allow this kind of stuff to happen inside the United States. And what FISA court does is basically a bridge that you can, you can in certain cases, direct this arsenal inward uh, on American centers when required. And it used to be the case before 9-11 that these were very rare instances, okay? especially in the 90s when the Cold War had died out and things were kind of much more calm, at least on the surface. And what we're seeing now is since 9-11, that these cases of the FISA court being used are much more extensive, much more frequent, and much more perva pervasive in nature than they have been ever in American history. Right, and as you say, to, to the extent we know what the FISA court does, and that's a very dubious proposition, but to the extent we do know that, it seems to have approved virtually every request that's ever come before it. Then again, you have to look at it from the government standpoint. Mm -hmm. The government standpoint would say, look, if we had this type of mass surveillance communications in the year 2000, chances are we wouldn't have had a 9-11. Yeah, that's the counter argument. It's the old security versus liberty argument. And, um, and, you know, that's fairly compelling when you've got skyscrapers being knocked down by planes. And that points to another thing that I want to mention is that we often assume that these debates are taking place in the absence of the population. And in many cases, when the government tends to, to be a bit more aggressive when it comes to the privacy of its citizens, many cases, citizens often support it. Sure. Okay? Citizens are saying, look, you know, I'd rather be safe. And I don't care if somebody's looking at my communications. And I think that in this particular case with the Snowden case, uh, America is also kind of divided. Many Americans are saying, you know, this is not constitutional. This is not right. Others are saying, well, who cares? I want to be able to go to work in the morning and not be afraid to be bombed by some crazy, you know, terrorist. So it's it's a divide, and it always has been like that, by the way. Well, I imagine it would be, and it, it's fairly, I've, I've actually seen people write this on, on various uh, internet sites and in the newspapers. I don't have anything to hide. I don't care if the government looks at me. So, you know, only people who have something to hide are going to care about this. Well, I understand that attitude, especially if you're scared, especially if you want the government to catch the bad guys. On the other hand, I think that maybe people who say such things really are not considering the government deciding that the government doesn't like them in particular and all the, the embarrassing and private things that the government could use against them if the government decided it wanted to. Sure. And we have, Do you really have nothing to hide? Nothing that's the least bit embarrassing that someone could use against you? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, you can't go back to the Edgar Hoover period mm -hmm. when, you know, Hoover kind of took this and run with it. And, you know, unions had nothing to hide. Uh, the SLC had nothing to hide. Um, 
you know, he, he even at some point, I think he bugged a Boy Scout uh, unit. You know, they had nothing to hide. <laughs> Those radicals. Right. And yet, yet you see this. They're a paramilitary uh, you know, organization. Yeah, it, it, could, it, could t- it could turn to the point where often people who have nothing to hide, in their opinion, are actually becoming targets of mm-hmm. uh, unlawful surveillance. Frightening prospect and a difficult balance to strike. Uh, something you said a moment ago uh, struck a memory in my mind. Uh, you said that uh, for a long time, we in the United States said this is simply not something we do. And I believe it was the Secretary of War Stimson at the beginning of the Second World War. I believe it was then. Uh, it was pointed out to him that we had almost no intelligence service and that we needed to have one. And uh, he said, I think famously, gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. Was that, yeah. The famous Stimson. Yeah, I think uh, it was Stimson who said that. And that is a marvelous attitude for a gentleman to have, or a lady to have for that matter. And and I hope that that's true. Uh, But we're not talking about polite society here. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about the struggle between nations and ideologies. And maybe we need to read other people's mail. I I think generally people recognize that today. I believe in the importance of intelligence. I want to have an intelligence service and a security service. I want to be secure. I don't want to live in a security state. That's a very different uh, form of, of existence. In my view, the types of surveillance that the government is engaged in right now, there is no question that it is to some degree making us safer. And I'm not going to argue against that, and I think that's probably accurate. That's a different question to whether it is actually constitutional and legal. Uh, I'm not a legal expert, I'm a political expert, but in my view, If, as a country, we decide at some point that it's worth sacrificing some of our liberties in order to become safer, then we should go ahead and do it if we decide it as a nation. But until we do that, some of the things that are happening right now are clearly illegal and unconstitutional. So what I'm saying to you is that we have to come to that decision, we have to have that discussion as a society and see what we value most. Liberty in this environment that you just pointed out is not exactly a gentleman's environment, or security. And if we decide to go for the latter, we should have the legal codes that are there to make sure that what the government is doing is not illegal, because at the moment the government is very much exposed. We've tried with FISA and we've tried with congressional oversight committees to assure that these sort of abuses won't happen. What else can we do to make sure that the executive department doesn't engage in this kind of activity? I think there are limitations to what we can do because a lot of this depends on the political context. For example, uh, during the Cold War, people were much more willing to let the government get away with uh, privacy violations than they were in the 1990s. After 2001 and 9-11, people are more willing to, again, uh, compromise on these issues than they were before. So this is not a solid state, it's a fluid state. It keeps changing with the political environment in which we find ourselves. Let's say that you and I came up, uh, in our infinite wisdom, came up with a great model of how to do things like that, how to you know, ensure that the intelligence services are not out of control. And then the next, very next morning, some crazy terrorist detonates a nuclear weapon in downtown New York. Mm. Now, I guarantee you that all of these great schemes that you and I have come up with are going to disintegrate in the next minute. Right. Right? So a lot of the, our conception of privacy and the relationship between the government and civil society and the citizen really depend on the situation out there in the real world. And so the government actually argue, and I think it's a pretty good argument, that, look, I, by doing this kind of surveillance, I'm, kind, I'm trying to protect the Constitution. Because if I don't catch that crazy terrorist with a nuclear weapon that's going to detonate in downtown New York, the next day you won't have a Constitution. You're listening to your weekly constitutional. I'm Stuart Harris, and I'm speaking with Professor Joseph Fitzanakis of King University all about the difficult choices that a president has to make. On the one hand, he's got to protect us. On the other hand, he's got to uphold the Constitution. Difficult balance going on there. After the break, we'll have our Madison Minute, and then we'll come back and we'll finish our discussion with Joseph Fitzanakis. Stick around. It's your weekly constitutional. I'm Stuart Harris, and I'm speaking with Joseph Fitzanakis of King University 
all about what might happen after terrorists detonate a nuclear weapon in a major American city. If a president has failed to intercept communications that, that might have prevented such an attack, is he really upholding the Constitution or is he going to be allowing the destruction of all of our constitutional values because of the reaction we might have to such an attack? That's a compelling argument, Joseph, and it's one that uh, I've made in the past or certainly have acknowledged in the past because uh, you're absolutely right. I think after we have something that catastrophic occur, people are really not going to be worried about the niceties of civil liberties. In fact, you can to take that particular example, I think the very next thing that would happen is that there would be a declaration of martial law and that the number one priority would be searching for any additional nuclear devices anywhere in the country. And at the same time, you'd have chaos because every major city in the country would be emptied. Everyone who lived in a major city would be running away from it because they'd figured that they were living in a target. So you'd have massive chaos throughout the nation and everybody would want to be looking for this and nobody would be worried about warrants. Nobody would be worried about, I mean, you could even imagine an extreme circumstance, uh, throwing up fences and having detention camps. If there was a feeling that this was a uh, Muslim terrorist, that you could have um, the whole communities targeted for that sort of in internment, if you will. It's a frightening, frightening scenario. And if we don't protect ourselves, I'm afraid that's what might happen. So I, that's, that's a compelling argument. And there's also a counter argument to that, right. not to mean to complicate the discussion, no, but I mean, right. let's look at the example, for instance, of Britain mm -hmm. in World War II. Now, the British entered the war. It took them a while before they actually got into it in terms of uh, putting forces on the ground. But between that time and the time they put forces on the ground, they were subjected to German bombardment on an almost nightly basis mm -hmm. for about two to three years. Blitz. The Blitz, right? The Luftwaffe would go over uh, Britain and bomb major cities, urban centers, and so on and so forth. The British during that period suffered a 9-11 in terms of casualties and damage every day for about two to three years. They did not get scared. They did not run away trying to change the, uh, the legal frameworks. They kept calm and they carried on and kept composed. And that's how they won the war. So the argument is if a nation is brave enough to withstand these kinds of threats while retaining what makes it a nation, what makes it a free nation, then that has more of a right to exist in a nation that gets scared about every other thing that happens, right? So the argument is that if you're serious about your constitution, you don't let anybody intimidate you into canceling it. It's a lot easier to keep calm and carry on before a nuclear attack than it is after a nuclear attack. And as much as I admire the British during the Blitz, I don't know if they would have had the same reaction if London had been destroyed on Monday, Coventry on Tuesday, Manchester on Wednesday, and on and on. Um, we're just talking about such a magnitude of destruction, so it's, ah, what a terrible balance we're having Absolutely. to strike here, what a terrible balance. Let me, let me posit one thing and, and, and inject at least one little note of optimism into this. Uh, as much as we're concerned about civil liberties and as much as we're perhaps dismayed, if not shocked, by Snowden's revelations, the simple fact that this has been going on throughout much of our history, and yet we still feel that we live in a free society, perhaps could give someone hope. I mean, there's no reason to panic and think that we're on the verge of an Orwellian police state right now. Uh, in fact, it, it, the technology has changed, certainly. But this stuff has been going on. We've dealt with it in the past, and perhaps we can deal with it in the future just as effectively. You're right. We have to struggle with it. That's the role of a free society. If we're not struggling with this issue, something's wrong. Before we leave, I want you to, to talk a little bit about King University and tell me about this new uh, security center that you're establishing there for the study of just these sort of issues. At King University, we have been teaching security intelligence studies for about two years now. It's a program that began very cautiously, not knowing what to expect. There are very, very few places that teach this on the undergraduate level in the United States. Well, before we know, we have almost 100 students that are taking the program, which is beyond our wildest expectations. And the reason that students are so interested in this is because it's an interesting subject, mm -hmm. the kinds of stuff we'll be talking about here today. And we thought it would be a pity, a great pity, to have these discussions limited inside the academic context. And so we established, as of uh, this year, 
a new King Institute for Security and Intelligence Studies. And what this is, is an organization that has, part of it is in the community, and part of it is in academia. And we're trying to make a bridge between the types of discussions we have about these issues in the academic setting and take it to this community as a whole. And so our plan is to have all kinds of public events, lectures, discussions, exhibits, and so on and so forth, special speakers that come to enlighten not just our students and our members of faculty, but also the community at large about these very critical issues for American uh, legal, political, social uh, context in which we find ourselves today. Well, that sounds very timely and very exciting and also, as you say, very interesting. So, Joseph, I hope you'll keep us apprised when you have these various public events and maybe we'll come and bring our microphone with us and then maybe we'll feature them on a future show. You'll be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joseph Fitanakis of King University. Well, that reminds me that we're all over the Internet, too, and you can contact us. Just Google your weekly constitutional. You'll find our Facebook page. Maybe check out WETS.org or maybe Google our new daily show, Your Daily Constitutional. I trust you. You can find us. Our executive producer is Wayne Winkler. Our distribution engineers are Bob Hoffman and Nick Rosa. Our scheduler is Carol Hutchinson. My name is Stuart Harris. And remember, you are a part of the American Experiment. 